you uh, chose to join us this morning for a uh, superb masterclass with one of the best musicians on the planet this is how good tmi is and uh, this is the kind of guests that we get uh, for tmi so so glad you uh, chose to join us uh, this morning we have philip smith who of course you know and probably have recordings of and have seen and heard about the famous philip smith from the new york philharmonic orchestra and various other groups now residing in georgia and working at uga with uh, one or two salvationists here actually so welcome phil we're glad you're here this morning it's nice to be here great it's, it's nice i was hoping actually i was really considering trying to make tmi in person this year and uh then the flu came across the ocean and it's knocked us all for a loop and here we are well, we'll and, hold and I was reminded, Nick, by your little welcome here, it reminded, it took me right the way back to when I was a kid with the lady that, I can't remember the name of the show, but she used to have a magic mirror and she used to look in the mirror and she used to say, and I, it's nice to see so and so and so and so and so and so. And I was thinking, man, it all comes back generations later. <laughs> it does, it does. And here we are. Who would have thought it in 2020 that we're all looking at computer screens and uh, enjoying this experience but we really appreciate you being here this morning phil and uh, we're going to get to know you a little bit and then you're going to uh, share some insights on playing the cornet and playing the trumpet and we have a couple of guinea pigs here uh, today that are going to be victims uh, we have anthony barrington who's uh, studying in juilliard in new york and of course is a member of the oklahoma citadel band and we have andrew morris who's going to go to uga hopefully uh, um, in uh, august if, if the uh, covid stays away and he's a member of the lawrenceville uh, core band so we have two outstanding uh, cornet and trumpet players uh, that will be victims later on so this is going to be a good time and phil uh, you're, you're too nice to, to victimize anybody but you know what i mean okay well well, uh, just a bit of house etiquette here. If you will remain muted, if you have a particular question, uh, you can kind of try and raise your hand. I'll see if I can catch you, uh, students. And there will be a time for questions later on where you can uh, put your burning question to Maestro Philip Smith. And uh, if you want to uh, rename yourself to something that I think most people have renamed themselves something sensible, which is good. Uh, so that I know who you are. And I should say, for those of you in this session, there are still some private lessons that you can sign up for with some excellent faculty. So please take advantage of that uh, today or, or tomorrow for the rest of the week. Okay, so here is Phil and we're gonna get to know you. Tell us, Phil, a little bit about yourself, where you're at and what you do currently. Currently, I am the Procasey, William and Pamela Procasey trumpet, trumpet, well, let me get this right. Professor of the Arts. Uh, it's not specifically a name title for a trumpet professor, but it's a, a professor for the arts. And I carry that title, which was initially given to Fred Mills, who was my predecessor at UGA. Fred Mills, of course, was with the Canadian Brass um, for a lifetime. And when he retired from there, he came to UGA. And when he unfortunately passed away, UGA came and asked me at the time, if I would be interested to come, I had already, Fred had had me down there and I'd, I'd loved the school, I loved everything about it. And uh, at the time I said, no, it's a little too early. I think I still need to keep playing. And uh, so they filled it um, uh, with David Bilger uh, for a couple of years, two, three years, whatever it was. And uh, then he left and they came back to me and I thought, you know, I'm not gonna let this thing go away twice. So at that point, I said, uh, yeah, let's consider doing that. So that's where I'm at. And I, I, I really, it's been, it's been, um, you know, Phil Smith career 2.0. And it's been really neat. I've absolutely loved working with the kids. It's been um, really uh, a shot in the arm to me in a lot of ways. I've loved it. I love working privately with the kids. One of the, the highlights was when I got there, um, they didn't entice me with this, but when I got there, it came up. How would you like to start a brass band? And I was like, are you kidding? And they said, no. So we started the UGA British Brass Band. And that is, a, of course, that's my passion. I just love brass banding. And I think it's the greatest tool that you can have to learn how to play. Uh, while I didn't have that as a student at Juilliard, I was a member of the New York Staff Band. 
So I had that experience going simul, you know, simulcast with, with, with uh, simultaneously with uh, Juilliard. And we don't really have that kind of situation there in Athens. So to have it actually in the school, it's just been a, a gas. It's been a lot of fun. Great. So that's what I do. That's a, a good brass band. They've really come along and uh, playing, playing really well. Tell us a little bit about your family, Phil, just so we can get to know you a little bit. Well, my dad is, my dad is Derek Smith, who uh, I, think he, I keep looking to see if he's signed on here. I told him about this and I don't see him. Not if yet. He, uh, so um, Derek, uh, as a young man, uh, I was actually born in London. As a young man, our family uh, were British. And post-war, World War II, my dad uh, was a solo cornet in the... Uh, mounted band that you see if you ever watch the Trooping of the Color or any of the Royals, pageantry. Exactly. He was in the Horse Guards, the Blues. Yeah. And and so um, if you ever see a band, if you're watching the Pomp and Circumstance of Britain and you see a band in gold uniforms riding horseback, that's what my dad did. Uh, of course, they functioned as a small band doing, you know, bandstands and things like that. And he was obviously on radio as cornet soloist numerous times. He was also a, a member of the famous... Uh, uh, Salvation Army Rose Hill Band, which was a competitive band. We weren't really supposed to talk about those things in those days, but it, it, against the ISB, there was the Rose Hill Band and they kind of became competitive to the point that they eventually had to disband the Rose Hill Band. But he was a, a young guy, Cornetus, with that. And you'll find some uh, 78 um, recordings of him doing Heavenly Gales and things like that. Uh, with that band. So anyway, he was, uh, he, I was, I was born in London while he was in the military there. Um, he did a tour uh, in, I, in uh, the 50s to Canada post-war. And like a lot of young men at that time, probably looking at London after the Blitz, he was thinking, well, the grass is greener on the other side. And so we emigrated to Toronto. Um, so I was uh, four when we emigrated there. Uh, the grass wasn't as green as we all thought it might have been or as he thought it was. And so we were actually on our way back to England when he got a call to come down to uh, New York. At that time, a uh, uh, Richard Holtz, a, a, a Captain Richard Holtz, I believe, uh, I think he was captain at that time, asked my dad if he'd be interested in coming down and be a solo cornet player with the staff band. And so instead of heading back to London, we went down to New York and my dad took on the role of playing uh, in the staff band and uh, got a job working for the Soviet Army, I mean, and that's where we stayed. And that was it. And then eventually you met your wife, Phil, had some children. Tell us about yeah. that. Yeah, we, we um, the, the Soviet Army Corps that we went to in, in Long Island, we went to Jamaica Citadel, which was a, a great old corps at that time. And then as what happens in most cities, the city expands and and folks keep moving out to the suburbs. And there was a new course started called the Hempstead Citadel Corps. And we were one of the first families that moved out to Hempstead. Um, my wife, Sheila, her father is Lloyd Scott, Captain Lloyd Scott, Major Lloyd Scott, he retired as. And he was a great musician, a great composer, and especially with vocal music. He, he'd written some old, lovely uh, songs to pieces. If you look up, uh, if you just go on to the uh, Salvation Army uh, site that you can get to there and look up Lloyd Scott, you'll find some some neat band arrangements and uh, and songs to music. He was a true Salvationist composer. I mean, he was, he was an officer, but he was musically gifted. And so you find that melded so nicely. Uh, his words and the songs to pieces are just, they're melded love, with lovely tunes. He was a tune meister. He knew how to write a melody. Well, that was the family that my wife grew up in. We went to high school together when, when they were stationed in the uh, New York area. We were high school sweethearts. We went to our senior prom. Uh, she went off to go to do a vocal course degree at uh, Heart School of Music. And I stayed in New York at Juilliard. And we kept dating and uh, we broke up and then we dated again. And eventually we ended up getting married and here we are all these years later, so. And you have uh, children? Yeah, we have, uh, we have a son, um, you can do the math, he was born in 79, uh, and, and uh, Brian, and a daughter born in 82, Erica. 
And in fact, she is great with child even as we speak. She's expecting her third little boy in less than about two weeks. That's awesome. um, so we are here, grandma and granddad are here um, working, trying to corral six-year-old Noah and two-year-old Silas. And uh, they're wearing us out. I bet they are. <laughs> that, well, that's great, Phil. And uh, tell us a little bit about how you started playing. I presume the cornet initially, uh, probably in the Salvation Army, maybe your first teacher, how that all got started. Well, it, yeah, it was cornet. I mean, what choice you have when your dad is Derek Smith? <laughs> Um, there is no choice. Uh, you know, actually, my granddad was a wonderful euphonium player, Sid Smith, in uh, Pendon. And he, he taught my dad to play cornet. Uh, my my uh, great granddad on my, uh, my dad's mum's side, his name was Pedikin, and he was one of the first bandmasters um, at uh, Hendon Corps before all the cops came along. My right. grandmother used to say, we were here before the cops. <laughs> and, uh, and so our granddad, old granddad Pedican, he was the, one of the first early bandmasters of the Hendon Corps. And, uh, but uh, yeah, my dad, you know, it was just, I, was, I started to play like many of you all start to play, you know, you get your second teeth and uh, someone slaps, especially in the Salvation Army, someone slaps a brass instrument in your hand, it's usually a cornet. And, uh, and that's the way I started. And uh, I didn't have a teacher. I had my dad. Uh, I, you know, who needs a teacher? I just had my dad. It, 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 you know, he'd, every now and again, we didn't have regular lessons, I would say that. But I, I, and to be honest, I hate practicing. To this day, I hate practicing. Um, I would rather, I played in everything. I played in whatever band I could get in, whatever group I could get in. And so that's how I, that's how I learned to play. And every so often, my dad would say, son, he always calls me son, son. Let's go in the basement and have a blow. And, uh, and I, always, uh, I always think that's a great line. It wasn't let's go in the basement and have a buzz. Hmm. It was, let's go in the basement and have a blow. We yeah. blew. Air through lips that vibrate and we made music. Sing and make songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. And uh, he was my teacher. And it, and it was an oral approach. He would pick up a horn and say, play it like this. And then I would try to play it like that. And he was, always, he, he was a tough tough old guy he made you do it his way and it was his way or the highway and often that ended i'll be honest with you it, it, there are many times it ended in tears and lessons <laughs> and i can hear my mom up in the kitchen she'd be yelling derek leave him alone <laughs> and he'd say, if he doesn't want to play he can he can put it away and you know it was it, it, it usually ended up in some kind of family squabble whatever but I, I still wanted to play. I just liked to play. And I, I used to go hear my dad play with the staff band and see him stand up and play solos mm -hmm. and at the Temple uh, Auditorium there on 14th Street in the city, in New York. And I just love that. I love the sound and I love to see my dad play and I just wanted to be like him. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, that's how I learned to play. He was my only teacher until other than my, you know, having a, a band director in high school or orchestra director or whatever. He was the only teacher I ever had until I went to Julia. So well, uh, I think we can say that it worked, Phil. Didn't yeah. It? And uh, what a great experience to have uh, Derek uh, teaching you. And what were some of the things that really made an impression upon you? What I mean, did he talk about the facility of the technical stuff or was it the range or was it the sound or was there something that you took from Derek uh, that was very important that lasted for a lifetime, really? Obviously, there was there was an element of technique, you know, tuning, say, say, ta, tu, tu. We worked out our organs, tu, 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 tu. And then as we went higher, it was tu, 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 t, 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 say, t. And you go for that high note, whatever that high note was, it could have been a C on the staff. And, you know, say, t, t. And so that the idea of the tongue arc, he didn't get into the nitty gritty of the tongue arcs and blah, blah, blah. We didn't get into that. It was just fundamental techniques, the uh, conversation, really. I never really spoke about breathing and all of that stuff, but it was more oral approach. It was, you know, dun, 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 How does Arvin say to play that eighth and two sixteenths? Da, 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 dun, dun, da, 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 dun, dun. No, Arvin says to put a sixteenth in there, so play it. Touch, da, da, dun, touch, da, da, dun, touch, da, da, dun, 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 Make it bouncy. Uh, style. Style was always a big thing. And of course, if we were playing, if we were working on our, on a solo, 
um, you know, typical Soviet army solo, you got the cadenza, you got the tune. Well, it was, you got to look, you got to say that it was always lyric oriented. It was expressive tunes. And when I went to band practice, whether that was junior band or later in the senior band, dad was always talking about the words, express the words. This has to be played lyrically. And he would give us the words of the songs. And we tried to play them chorally in that sense. Um, so it was that, that kind of teaching. That, that was really the way it was. And then it was a lot of listening that there was always music on in the house. So it was, it was just constant listening to different people play. And then you, you went to Juilliard and had an experience there. And then right at the end of your time at Juilliard, which I presume was a good experience for you, uh, mm -hmm. you, you got hired in, in Chicago, right? In the symphony orchestra there. Yeah. What was that like uh, moving cities and then sitting in a, a, a world famous orchestra like Chicago Symphony? Well, uh, just the quick, the quick story is that um, I went to Juilliard at, and really uh, my first couple of years at Juilliard were not fun. I, I was a, I was a good little cornet player. Um, and, and, you know, so I think I held my own in that regard, but I was, I had not been brought up trumpety. So elements of trumpet playing, I didn't know, I didn't know repertoire. I knew the tunes. I could play the I could play the fiddle parts, but I couldn't, you know, I couldn't play the stupid trumpet part because it was an F, and I didn't know what F meant. <laughs> you know, that didn't mean a hill of beans to me. Yes. So, um, and and I didn't like the competitiveness. I didn't like the aggression of students. You know, this 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 professional this music school aggression. And and I can remember after a couple of years, I really. I wanted to leave Juilliard. I didn't, did not like it. It was not a pleasant time. Um, it turned around uh, for, for various reasons that are too long to get into here. But um, my last two years at Juilliard in my bachelor's were, were good years and I got a chance to play uh, in an orchestra. I was still behind the eight ball. Mm -hmm. A lot of my learning was memorization. Um, I, I, I was not a good transposer, uh, just not good. And um, it got to, I, I, at that time, if you did four years undergrad, you could do your masters in one year. Mm -hmm. I did three years with a gentleman by the name of Ed Troidel, who was a wonderful teacher. He, I credit him really with trying to get me to grow from being a, a feminine sounding cornet player to a more masculine color. David, I hope you're listening to this, David Delaney. Yeah, you're, yeah. you're feminine. Yeah, and, and expand that out. He never told me not to play like a cornet. He never told me to give that away. He just, he just grew the color palette hmm. and, and play with more masculinity and you know, more, more sound, more breath, more, more wind, shouting wind. I can remember him talking about that, shouting wind. And, uh, but after a while, like with any teacher, it, you know, you sort of hear the same thing. And after three years, I thought, I, you know, I'm kind of hearing the same thing. So either I'm not getting it or I need to move on. And I still feel like I'm behind the eight ball on the not learning the orchestral rep. So I went, I asked Mr. Vacchiano, Bill Vacchiano, who was first from the film on at that time, if I could come and study with him. And I did, it created a real tension between the two gentlemen and me, and which thankfully got healed when I came back to New York. Um, but um, I went there and I studied Juilliard. My first audition, after in my halfway through my master's year, I said, I've got to start playing auditions. And the first opportunity I had, first orchestra that let me show up and play an audition, that's a whole nother story, um, was uh, the Chicago Symphony, hmm. completely open audition. And I went and played. That was there then, right, Bud Herseth? Yeah, I went and played. Uh, Bud Herseth was the first trumpet. Uh, Vince Chikowitz had been second trumpet. Bill Scarlett, another Salvation Army. Yeah person was third and assistant first, and Charlie Geyer was fourth. Vince Chikowitz retired, they moved Charlie Geyer up to second, and they auditioned for fourth, and that's where, that was where I came in. That was an unbelievable situation. I was green. Mr. Herseth used to refer to me as, hey, greenhorn. <laughs> and uh, I never lost that in three and a half years of Chicago. I was still greenhorn. Um, but he was really good and I think he saw that I wanted to learn. I would go to every rehearsal. The first year I didn't really play much. I used to get frustrated but I went to every rehearsal and I sat there with the part and I sat there with the score and I sat and listened and eventually he said you know what I want you on stage mm -hmm. and he says you may only play two bars so I'll pass you down something or we'll pass you something uh, but I want you on stage and what that did to me was oral 
I got to hear what it sounded like. I got to watch them. I got to see them. I used to angle my chair so I could look all the way down the line, past Bud, past um, Friedman and uh, Chris Foley on second bone and, and Kleinhammer bass trombone and Arnold Jacobs uh, tuba and Dale Clevenger just in front. I used to just sit and listen and watch and just experience it. That was the best postgraduate degree that I could have ever had. <laughs> and uh, who were some of the other uh, trumpet players that would have been around? Maurice Andre, maybe? Or well, yeah, they, my 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 heroes, my Gabriels. Okay? We all need Gabriels to listen to. The guys that I listened to were um, obviously Maurice Andre. This 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 French guy comes out playing this little trumpet, piccolo trumpet. And it's playing all of this wonderful stuff. And that was just like, man, LPs were coming out and it was like, who is this guy? And how does he do this? That was incredible. Um, and then really, uh, there weren't a whole lot of soloists in those days. Um, and, and so you sort of had my predecessor at the Philharmonic was Jerry Schwartz. Mm. And he was doing some solo work. There was a lot of Ger Gerard Schwartz. If you look those, that name up, you'll find a lot of LPs. And then there was a guy that played first trumpet in LA and his name was... Um, Tommy. Tommy. What? Tom Stevens. Tom, yeah. yeah. Senior moment, sorry. Uh, Tom Stevens. And what was wonderful about Tom Stevens was I loved the way he sounded. Yeah. And he played this, this solo repertoire, but he was also, you could listen to him play The Planets with mm -hmm. Zubin Rater, a great recording uh, with the LA Phil. And, and I was like, that's what I want to do. I want to, I love doing the solo thing, but man, he can do both of these things. And, and I just intuitively latched onto him. There were other great players that I listened to that I loved. Obviously I loved, uh, my dad for some, for some reason seemed, must have liked Philly. Uh, orchestra. There was a lot of Philly orchestra recordings in those days. And so here in uh, Gil Johnson, a very unique, distinguished tone, s s vibrant tone. And I love listening to him play. And then really, as I was a student at school, I began to tune into Chicago. I loved, I loved what I heard in Chicago. There was this guy, Hersa, the leading this, and this, 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 this charge of the brass was just incredible. New York was a different sound. New York, they were, they were more independent sound and they didn't have kind of this, this wall approach, um, this unified approach that just seemed to there. And I locked into his playing. I love the femininity of his playing. If he could play um, uh, Song of the Nightingale, the mm -hmm. little fisherman bit or Kiji, and he could sound like a cornet player. And then the next minute you'd hear him on, Mahler or Shostakovich and it was like <laughs> like a laser going through the sound and I was like man what a, that's fantastic and so I was really I was tuned into that kind of stuff now uh, tell us a little bit about the difference uh, between uh, playing a cornet and now approaching the trumpet and uh, was it something that actually helped you become a better trumpet player the fact that you were a Salvation Army cornet player growing up I think so uh, I definitely think the repertoire challenges you on cornet. Um, pick, your, pick your simplest solo, you know, Jesus shall reign. You've got a little cadenza, you've got a tune, you got a movement that's a, da -da 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 -da, a triple movement, da -da -da -da, then you got the da -da 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 you got the running 16th, you got the minor movement, you know, more lyricism with minor color. And then you got the the triple tongue bit, and then you got the razzle dazzle at the end. So any Salvation Army solo, any cornet solo, and to be honest with you, as far as I'm concerned, as far as I'm concerned, Salvation Army cornet solos are some of the best solos that you can ever play. And hmm. uh, in, many, in many ways, I think they're even better than Herbert Clark solos, hmm. or, or I think Belstadt solos are better than Herbert Clark solos oftentimes, but, but there, are, there are standouts, I'm not saying that, but in general, Salvation Army solos are not to be looked down at. Mm. They are some great repertoire, and I have my kids work on those things at school. Um, uh, but, but certainly the cornet, from the technical point of view, informed me, you know, pushed me. I think I was a better, I can remember, I can remember Vacchiano's when I was playing my Arbins number no. one in my audition at Juilliard. It goes down to a lower shot. And he said, kid, play that again. Kid, 
play that again. I never heard anyone play that F sharp like that. I didn't know that it was good or bad. I was just doing what I'd been taught to play, and it was just the way I'd been taught to play. Um, and and that comes out of that brass banding cornet style. The technique is great, but the lyricism is also there. The beauty of tone, the color of tone is also there. Um, and so it's just, it, it, it informed, it definitely informs, and you don't lose it. You, you don't say, oh, I'm not, play, I'm not playing that way. I'm only going to not play this way. No, you, it, you just add to the color. Mm. Now, you, you moved to New York Philharmonic and uh, became co-principal, I think, in, in 78, and then principal uh, for real in 88. And you work with some fantastic conductors, uh, Kurt Mazur, uh, Zuba Mehta, of course, Leonard Bernstein. Um, tell us about some of those experiences getting to New York and what, what that was like. Well, I, I mean, obviously, Zubin Mehta was the guy that hired me. So I have a great affinity for him, great love for him. Just um, and, and what I loved about Zubin Mehta was that he loved music. You just watch, you just Google Zubin Mehta and watch YouTube things of Zubin. He's always grinning. It's like, this is cool. He's just having it. Every time you see his face, he's happy. He's like, you know, this is a, and as a young kid, I mean, heck, I only, I, I went from Juilliard, you know, minimal orchestral experience, Chicago, three and a half years as principal fourth, um, and, and, and just really trying to copy Bud. I got many times got to play second to Bud, and I just would try to copy Bud in sound and style and color and everything. Uh, now all of a sudden, I'm thrust into New York as a principal player, and I'm going, whoa, how did this happen? And, you know, so you start to hear the flutes, every trumpet kid's going to know a little thing out of the flutes. And you, you just, and I just hear, I remembered how Bud did it. Boom! And it was just like, yeah. And then, it, you know, but before you're nervous about it, you start to hear, and then I look up and there's Zubin going. <laughs> and I'm going, okay, he thinks it's going to be cool. What the heck? Let's go for it. And you just kind of went for it. So I, he was just the great, he was the right man at the right time for a young greenhorn coming into a principal position. He was just so enthusiastic, so encouraging. That was great. Um, the next man we went to as a boss was uh, Mazur. Um, much more, and just look at his face, he looks like a gargoyle. I say that with all love and respect, but he looks like a gargoyle. And, uh, and and that and and his his old German thing was you know, no matter if you think you're right, you're wrong. Mm. Uh, it was that kind of attitude, and it was just kind of like I'd had I'd grown up with a dad and with a granddad who had sort of a stern face to it and that English bulldog kind of thing. So I was like, okay, well, you don't scare me none. So, but uh, I enjoyed working with him. I really did love working with him, and he brought a depth to some of the repertoire that. that the, the Germanic romantic repertoire, which is classical and romantic repertoire, which is really great, as well as Shostakovich. He was a great Shostakovich conductor. Um, but his, his new music was kind of, that, was, that wasn't his cup of tea. And then we went on to Mazel. Mazel was wonderful. Mazel was, the, Mazur was kind of a lunger. You know, he, he looked like a boxer when he was playing. Mazel was very pristine. He was, again, an older gentleman, and he could give you every 16th if you needed it. Wow. Every one of those 16s you'd see in a beat. Do, do, do. <laughs> and <it was> like, <laughs> yeah, so I learned stick technique from Mazel, mm. uh, but he was uh, he was also a wonderful musician. And what about uh, Len? Did you get a chance to work? Lenny with Bernstein, yeah. I mean, what do you say about Lenny Bernstein? I mean, you grow up as a kid, and and Lenny Bernstein, you wa I watched some of those uh, young people programs. Yeah. A, a, a genius, a, a, just a genius of a musician. And the first time I saw him, I was shocked at how short he was. He was just a little guy. I mean, I was just a, a teen okay. guy. And I'm going, I, I envisioned this gigundo giant of a man, but he wasn't. Um, an interesting man, a very interesting man, troubled in many ways, really conflicted uh, in many, many ways. You look at a lot of his repertoire, a lot of it has to do with Song of Songs, the Jeremiah Symphony. It's, it's a lot. It's, he's, he's constantly exploring his Jewish roots. And, and there's conflict in there with him and, and that. And, and he was complicated. That's the best, best way for me. To you had a, a great recording with him, the, the Quiet City. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, any anything you did with him, yeah, he oozed heart. Yeah. He oozed music, and he was not quote unquote a good conductor as far as stick dicting, but but his body just. It, it just amplified what you needed to do. So when you see, boom, and you saw that kind of motion, that was, yeah, you didn't give a half-hearted, huh. yeah. no, when you lean like that, you gave it to him. And, you know, so when we're doing the Copeland's uh, Symphony 3, that, that some, Symphony Number no. 3 is great. If you don't know that, listen to that. Mm. If that doesn't knock your socks off as a brass player, I don't know what won't. <laughs> but um, it's high C city, and I'm talking mm -hmm. concert C's. I'm talking C trumpet C's, and it's just ah, man, you get to be Herseth and Maynard Ferguson and all wrapped into one. And it's really great. And, and you, you like uh, the Mahler stuff, five and maybe three. Yeah, uh, you know, all, all those pieces are good. They're all they're all good pieces. Um, I mean, I, I there's so much that I like. Yeah. But the thing with Lenny was that he did that. And we, we did, in those days, you would do a recording session. They, they would record all of the concerts and then they would kind of piece them together to make a recording. Okay. And if they didn't have all the bits, you'd show up after your four concerts and you'd have a, re a recording, a, a makeup session. That was just to cover the bits they still hadn't quite gotten. Uh, and then in that makeup session, he says, okay, we're going to do Quiet City. <laughs> And so here we've just been roaring on yeah. Shostakovich 5 for a week. And it's like, oh, I guess we're doing Quiet City. So mm -hmm. fundamentally, when you listen to that recording of Quiet City, I think we didn't go, I, if we went through it three complete times, that was a lot. We, mm -hmm. we for sure went through it twice and we may have done a bit of wow. bit and piece. And that's what's on that recording. That's great. Well, we have a couple of young players that I'm sure are going to have a, a career just like yours, Phil. Uh, super talented young people that uh, we're really proud of. One of them is uh, Anthony Barrington, who's out of Oklahoma City, and uh, he's at Juilliard right now, studying there. I want to say, Anthony, that you're a, a junior. Would that be right? You might have to unmute. Sorry, I have to unmute myself. I'm actually going into my senior year, my final year at Juilliard. Yeah. Oh my so, goodness, how time yeah. races. And then uh, after we uh, listen to Anthony and you dissect his playing, Phil, uh, we're going to listen to Andrew Morris, who's uh, starting his journey uh, headed to UGA in a little bit. So I'll let you work with Anthony and we'll listen along and hopefully learn something. Cool. Anthony, how you doing, man? I'm feeling really good. I feel good. Da 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 da. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, all right. So, what are you going to play for me? Okay. So, I'd like to play um, the introduction and the cadenza of the Artunian concerto. If that's okay, cool. All good. Yeah. Yeah. Now we don't have a ton of time, so I'll move quick, and sure. I won't dissect as much as kind of wipe the surface. Well, if we can't get to everything, that's fine too. But no, that's, that's fine. That's fine. Just, just go for it, man. Let me hear it. Okay. if you want me to or we can work oh, oh, you're gonna you're gonna jump to the dance okay let's just talk about that first a little bit okay okay it was great it was great it was a lot of really good stuff um i like the fact that you, you know it's like anything you've you've always got to be as a musician you want to take everything and spread it apart you don't want to play in a box that's about this way so dynamically you want to spread things apart um color wise you want to spread things apart you always want to move things apart and you were doing that and that that was really great um 
You've obviously spent some time listening. You've got some concepts that you like, and that's the best thing to do. I would, whenever I was doing a piece, I would listen to every recording that I could find of that piece. And nowadays for you guys, that's a piece of cake. I used to have to buy them and then beat them up with a needle. Um, but nowadays you guys can do this all on Spotify instead of buying my album. Um, but, uh, uh, but anyway, uh, it, it, you need to listen to that. And, I, and then what you do is you listen and you go, oh, I like what that guy did. I like what that guy did. And, you, and in the process of copying, you create who Anthony Barrington is. And that's exactly what's going on. That's really cool. One suggestion I have. At that point, you cannot go brain dead. When you go, you've got to know what's going on underneath you. Right. You've got to know that that, and you've got to hear that music underneath. Okay. And that long note has to go somewhere. You've got to give it space to let the orchestra come in. And you're, you've got to send your note off at the end with that so that you just don't kind of Peter that note out. Da -da 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 Nothing happened. Okay. Ready? The orchestra's doing something, but you got to do something as well at the end. And the same thing. I, I, you know, it's it's a smithism. I might like you to move a little bit in different places. You need to make sure you hear the orchestra parts, the accompaniment parts underneath. So that again, you, you, we've got to be as, I guess the general gist of what I'm saying here is you've got to know the accompaniment as well as you know your solo part and you've got to hear it in the time that you've given it. If you go, dee -da -dum, dee -da -dum, I've already got a problem. Why? Because you gave me. So if you go, you never gave me time. You set me up for a tempo, but you didn't give me the time to get to that beat. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. I'm always here in the orchestra, as, and that's where you and I might separate sometimes, or you, the student, not you necessarily, you, but you, the student and me. Yeah, I understand. Um, that was cool. Um, all right. So. Um, yeah, that was great. You want to go on to the condenser? Play a little? Sure. Yes. I'm sorry. It's a no, good no, no, ending. Sorry. I okay. really I'm love it. I'm <laughs> only, the ending is a very poorly composed ending. I agree. When I, when I played it, I thought, that, you know, there's got to be a way to end this somehow. So I, uh, so I came up with that. 
bum, 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 bum. I wanted to get myself up to the upper octave on that. Mm. So um, that's, that's why I did that. Okay. Um, similar things to what I said before, the, uh, the, 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 the differences have to be there. Let me just say this. You've got to be careful. And it's hard doing it in this format. I don't like teaching in this format. But it's hard. To, I've got to be careful that when you go to soft, whether it be high or low or wherever it is range-wise, when you go to soft, that you don't pinch it this way. Because that's when you're going to have trouble. Uh, let's see. You've got to give yourself enough time. That's an aggressive statement. Then you've got to calm yourself. You got to be careful that you don't come in now like that, because that's when things are going to get tough. Yeah, just give yourself a tad more time. Can we go back and do just a smidge? Uh, yeah. before I, I was actually going to ask um, when you mean tight, you just mean the, the facial muscles whenever I'm, I'm getting yeah. softer. It, it's air wind through lips that vibrate. It is not, it's not everything tight this way. You have a choice. You have a choice to come too tight or not so tight and make sure there's some wind. It's an element of wind. So for me to play softer in a higher range, I have the option to become so tight that a little piece of little wind is going through there, but I've got this e sign kind of sound, or I can be more open and, and this can be much more open. Okay. Um, let's just try this. Let's just try, let's try a G on the staff. And, and I want you to go, foo, foo. I want to hear air through the horn and then a note come. Okay. Yeah. So what's, what's, what's going, what I need, what if I be working with you here, I need you to find where that balance of air turns into note. You go to find that note. And in the process of finding that note, there's a balance that you find. There's a, there's a shape that comes into being yeah. and that note speaks. Do a C. Okay. Mezzo piano. You want to find where that is. So you touched it. Go ahead. No, Do sorry. Again. I don't mean to interrupt. Sorry. That's right. Go ahead. Do it again. Now do an E. Now do a G. All right. So you you got to find where that is coming from a wind place. Okay. So that you're not going and trying to buzz that G out, but you're mm -hmm. on a much more open apertured way. I don't want to get into the weeds here, but uh, you need to be more open than, than tight. Okay. Okay. So just try. Okay. And take just a smidge more time before you start that soft thing. Okay. You just want me to start right on that sort of scare time. Yep. Thing. That? Okay. say give yourself a little bit more space in it. You don't be in such a rush to start this new thing. Okay. You're two characters in the play. You're aggressive Max and you're sweet Nelly, you know? Uh, so give yourself just a tad more time to make that and to make it easy. One more time. Okay. idea so just give yourself a bit more time silence is your friend right that, that's part of the deal okay. work with silence that's part of the music as well all right let's move on thank you so much thank you. I really, I really yeah. appreciate that thank you Bravo.
We're all clapping for Anthony here. Well done, Anthony. Great job. Awesome. Now we have Andrew Morris, who is perhaps most well known for being the co-principal corner of the Lawrenceville core band. Um, and he's headed to UGA very soon. And Andrew, what are you going to play for us? Um, I'm going to play one of the audition pieces for the large ensemble at UGA this this um, this upcoming school year. Um, it's called Etude Number no. One by Eric Morales, and you're not going to recognize it at all. <laughs> no, I should I should explain, Andrew, just so folks know. All right. It's it, Dr. Craswell and I are always looking for you know something for you guys to practice over the summer, and uh, and then uh, to come back and and you know, play something prepared for us. And uh, this book, or the study book of Etudes by Eric Morales came out literally as we were making, I literally got it in the mail, sort of the day that we had to send stuff in as to what was gonna be on the website. And we thought, yeah, this is great because no one's gonna know how this goes. Everyone's, this is gonna show, A, just you know how, how you can put this together, what kind of musical shape you can find for this yourself. So off you go, no one's gonna know it, as you say. So. Go for the gusto, man. All righty. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Now we're getting into sort of rep repetition stuff. Gotcha. All right. Good stuff. That's, that's not bad. Really good. How did you do? How did you feel that you did uh, in terms of dynamics? Um, it's not as wide. It's very closed minded at this point. Um, I want to open that up. Um, yeah, I would agree. Louder, louder. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree that you just you could you could give me a bit more interest in the dynamics. Okay. Uh, that's one of those things. The other thing, one of my favorite rules, and if you come in my studio, you'll see it. Um, when you've got four sixteenths, and the first two are slurred, this is an Arbenz rule, really. It's, I mean, I, I refer to it as my dad's rule, but it's like having a picket fence. And the first picket, is, all these pickets, if it was built properly, are all equally spaced. But the first picket is a, is a piece of wood that goes all the way through. So you want, when you have two notes slurred, you want to elongate the first note of the slur as long as it can be in its time. The last note of the slur is lifted. Otherwise, it comes out it comes out too fast as opposed to that does a couple of things one it calms the spirit down two it gives you a harmonic structure i hear i hear the c d d d f d d d you see in the music there? And that dotted eighth and sixteenth is today, 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 today. I want my day to be longer. Day, today, today, today. I don't want day, today, today, today. It's going to start getting choppy. And then play with the syncopation. You got a little bit. So let it let it have a bit more gas. Just play me up to number nine. Just adding that dimension. Yeah, one other dimension for you to think of. 
when you get to bar six. Not in a rush. Hold it back. Hold it back. Hold it back. Go fast. Okay. Off you go. Up the line. Play me a C. No, play me a C and hold it. Play me a C and hold it. Bum. I want to hear that note. Dia ta ta dum. Dia ta ta dum. Just play that first beat a few times. I didn't hear it. Can you make the C any longer? Let's see. Okay. That was a good one right there. The last one was the best one. You want the first note of the slurs to be longer. I would go through this and I'd put a tenuto every first note over every first note of a slur. Okay? Because I want to hear it. Otherwise I hear I, I hear a percussive sound. Da -da 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 -da. I don't hear it. Da -da -da. Okay. okay, off you go, up to nine. was better believe it or not in my mind that was better already it's still something you're going to work on you're a little uncomfortable with that lengthening of the first slur so the first bar wasn't quite as good but when you got into the second bar and the third bar and, the, and the, it got better so you've got it i would literally go through them put a tenuto over every first note of the slur okay now i get into the uh i i'm not going to go here but i i now get into this the little petrushka thing I gotta make sure I get dia 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 as if you're climbing a ladder. Dia 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 da. The first notes of the slurs have to be long, otherwise they'll come up. Okay. So just all right. The slur two tongue two. Yeah. Okay. First. Um. Yeah. First notes of slurs are all long. All right. Okay, do me a favor. Let's start at bar uh, 15, 14, 13. Bar 13 on the second beat, and I want you to go just into 17, 18, and I want to hear a difference dynamically. Right on that forte? Yep. And this is, we're going to stop right here. On um, At 17? Yep. Yeah, I want, I, want, I want to hear the dynamic. I want you to get down. Come on, let's go. Yeah, so you've got to, now I would, here's what I would do to help you learn how to do that. I would turn that into slurs. So that bar before 17, da -da 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 I would slur that whole bar and I would slur it and do a diminuendo and hold the last C sharp so that I'm holding it at piano. Okay. All right. That's how I would go at that. All right. I think we need to move on. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. That's yeah. awesome. And uh, Anthony too. Uh, that's, it's not an easy thing to put yourself in that position. And of course with the zoom microphones, and everything, but both of you sounded really good. Yeah. Thanks for Phil. Somebody texted me, Phil, and said, you're a goat. But I think it's a compliment. I think they mean you're the, the greatest uh, ever or something. Yeah, um, <laughs> insult. But they're saying what you're saying is just awesome. And thought I shaved. Good teaching. Yeah. <laughs> um, listen, uh, just a couple of announcements. We're going to go another 15, 20 minutes here, folks. So stay with us because this is such good stuff. Uh, we're just uh, getting pearls of wisdom from the master here. And you're going to want to hang with us. Uh, let me just say a couple of things. Um, coming up later today, 
at one o'clock Eastern is Dr. Stephen Cobb on a brass leadership uh, masterclass. It's going to be amazing. And uh, don't miss that. And then also later on at three o'clock, Neil Smith is going to talk about youth music groups, getting them going and what it's like to run a youth band or a singing company. So some good stuff today. And tomorrow at 11 o'clock is Boston Brass. They're going to do a masterclass, which is going to be great. And uh, we have some uh, students for them. I think Rodney Jean's going to play for them tomorrow. And uh, lots of good stuff happening. Uh, Bill Himes is coming in tomorrow at one o'clock and Ronnie Murchison at three o'clock. So loads of good stuff. Also, some of you haven't signed up for private lessons. I'm looking at Timmy Burley right now and Steph Hall and saying there are some amazing teachers out there that are ready to give their time for you. So please go on and sign up for a lesson and it will be a great experience. I want to give you the chance to ask some questions uh, in a moment. Uh, so be thinking of that and if you have a question uh, you can raise your hand or you can chat to me if you have that facility and just say I have a question uh, but I have two questions for Phil so I'm going to use my time on those two questions uh, Phil clearly you're one of the best musicians on the planet how do you stay humble I work on my relationship with the Lord great humility Bible talks about humility um, first of all, I don't believe a word anyone says about the greatest this or that. Um, I just try to do the best job I can do, um, as we all, as we all should, and whatever we're doing, our, our goal is not to be the greatest. Our goal is to do the best that we can do. And in that process, one might achieve something, but that's in looking backwards. I'm not looking forwards. I'm just, I'm in the present. I'm doing the best that I can do to be humble of spirit, to be encouraging, uh, all of those kinds of things. Scripture tells us, Scripture, you just look up humility in the Scripture. There's a ton of verses. Well, and, and I've witnessed this with you, Phil, and of course you have this fantastic career, amazing musician, but perhaps the thing that I admire about you most is how you've done all of that uh, with a deep spiritual commitment. And I was able to observe a, a master class at UGA recently, and uh, of course it's not a spiritual environment particularly uh, but the first thing you said to the first player you quoted scripture and i've been at your concerts with the uga brass band and you have no trouble quoting scripture and explaining why some of these pieces like triumph of peace or just as i am which you've used with your bands um so just tell us how you have been able to keep your spiritual life vibrant in in what is kind of a tough environment as a professional musician look every environment that we go in is going to be a tough environment. Just watch the news. Mm. We're living in a tough environment. Mm. It's tough right now. Um, um, you're going to be going to school. Many of you are in college. You're going to be confronted. You're going to be uh, accosted, if I can use that word, especially if you're holding on to faith, an, an element of faith. Um, the other part is to remember that, um, well, okay, I was, I was thinking about verses, and one of the verses that is, has always been a, a favorite verse of mine, and it's a favorite verse of many, you hear it often, so I, I don't, that's why I sometimes steer away from it, because even though it was one of my first favorite verses, it's, it's almost become standard. But it's, it's Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, which says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, Jesus, and he will make your path straight. There's some great stuff in there. Trust in the Lord. That's the first phrase. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. It doesn't mean on Sunday. It means trust in the Lord with all your heart. You've got to be invested in scripture. You've got to be invested in worship. You've got to be saying, I want a relationship with Jesus Christ. And I want that. You wouldn't get, you, you, there's no way you're going to have a great relationship with your girlfriend or your boyfriend if you're only dealing with it on Sunday. Um, it's got to be a daily thing. And lean not on your own understanding. We live in a day where, well, I think, well, I think, I think this and I think that. No, I don't care what you think. I want to go to the source. <laughs> what does God say about, pick the subject? Mm. What does God have to say about that? Let me dig in there. Let him challenge me rather than me tell him what I think. Um, in all your ways, acknowledge him. When you're on top of the mountain, acknowledge the Lord. 
when you're down in the dumps, acknowledge the Lord. When you're happy, acknowledge him. When you're sad, when in all, because you're going to go, life does that for, we go through all of the ups and downs, the valleys, the depths, the heights. Uh, but in all your ways, in every place you go, acknowledge him, give him that. So that's a challenge. That was a challenge to me. Am I acknowledging or am I just being quiet? Acknowledge him quietly and sometimes verbally. And he will make your path straight. You're worried about where you're going in the future. Christ has created you. You are a creation. He created the world, but he has created you with specific gifts and specific talents and specific, and he's brought circumstances into your life. There are events that only you can do at any given time. And uh, God's pruning you to, to do that job. So that's, that, that's something that keeps me very humble is that God has used me. I've seen it. It's easy to be humble when you look backwards. It's, you know, so. Well, that's awesome, Phil. And uh, it's not every trumpet masterclass that you get such a great sermon uh, to. And I really believe for our young people, I, I see their faces on here, their names. These are uh, wonderful young people that have their whole lives ahead of them. And mm -hmm. that word was just perfect for them. Well, I wonder if anyone has any questions. Uh, you might have to show your, your video and raise your hand. Uh, if you have a particular question, and Andrew Morris and Anthony both have questions. I bet they do. Um, um, so let's go to Andrew first. Um, you'll have to unmute yourself, Andrew, and then ask yeah. a question. Yeah. Um, just staying on the topic of um, UJ auditions, the other piece that we're playing is a um, concert piece for cornet by James Kernow. And um, when uh, Dr. Craswell sent that in the um, announcement email, he told us to look up your um, your solo of that. And um, I had a question whether or not you played it on cornet or trumpet. Um, I've done it on both, to be honest with you. As far as the recording, I think I played it on cornet. Did you? Okay. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. So again, um, there are times to be cornetti and times to be trumpet and you can be on one instrument and sound like the other, or you can be on the other instrument and sound like the other. So there's a crisscross there. Gotcha. All yeah. right. Thank you. Good question, Andrew. And I should say that uh, Matthew Byrne is playing that piece in a master class with Dr. Jeffrey Barrington on Thursday morning. And I think he's playing it on trumpet, even though it's a cornet piece for, for, for cornet. Okay, uh, Anthony had a question. Unmute yourself, Anthony. Yes, I do. So <clears throat> very recently, I've been doing a little bit of studying on the, um, like, just the history of the New York Philharmonic and the players that have gone through it and whatnot. And two names that I found particularly interesting that I think not have just gotten lost in the music world, but specifically in the trumpet world that you might be able to comment on are um, Lou Ranger and Johnny Ware. Um, those are two names that I, I, I have very limited knowledge on, and I can't seem to get a lot of information from other trumpeters that might have had a relationship with them. But I know that you uh, played with them, and so I was wondering if you could just talk about them just for a little bit. I, I'm very curious about them because I've heard recordings of them, and but I, I haven't been able to understand. I mean, they, they just go lost after they're out, out of the New York Philharmonic, so. <clears throat> well, many of us do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, when you retire, some choose to retire and do what I'm doing, and others choose to retire and go fishing. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and, it, and I never thought I would say this, but I mean, I, I, I'm shocked at how many of my colleagues have retired after a career in the Philharmonic and have literally put the horn away. You know, violin, instrument, whatever, and they just, that, they're done. And I think it's the intensity of, of what we do or a career that sometimes people need to just say, I'm done with that. Um, I, 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 I'm not like that. I've, I've had to deal with focal dystonia and I'm still trying to flip and play. If anybody were to put the horn away, I would have put the horn away. But, uh, I'm still trying to, I'm still trying, I'm still too stubborn because I want to play. But in terms of you answering your question, Johnny Ware was, um, I can't give you dates, but he's, he's in the Philharmonic a long, long time, a full career. He was a uh, third and assistant trumpet to, to uh, Bill Vacchiano. And uh, in actual fact, if you listen, there's a wonderful recording of Johnny where 
of Bernstein doing a Mahler three. And in those days, and in many of the orchestras, you'd have the first trumpet would play the first trumpet in the orchestra. Well, the first trumpet would either play first trumpet in the orchestra and the assistant would, would play the post horn or vice versa, they would do that. When I went to Chicago, Herseth did both. And so that was, that was hmm. the reason that I did both. Um, I was challenged to do that by him. But uh, you'll hear this recording, this old recording of Mahler Three, and Johnny Ware is playing the offstage solo. Uh, just sounds beautiful. Johnny was a wonderful, he was another little guy. Just, I mean, I mean, if he was five foot five, that was it. Uh, little skinny guy, but what a powerhouse player. Uh, he had a wonderful career playing first trumpet, I think in Kansas City before he came to the Philharmonic and stuff like that. Um, a very feisty man, man that was very involved in orchestra politics. He was chairman of the orchestra committee in numerous ways. And I have to say that sometimes that affected him in a negative way, you know, having to deal in that political environment, it kind of poisoned him a little bit, um, just in his spirit. Um, but he was a great trumpet player. Uh, and so when I joined the Philharmonic, well, when Va he was assistant principal to Vacchiano, when Vacchiano retired, Johnny Ware, I think, expected to be moved up to principal. And I think the biggest disappointment in his life is that Boulez did not do that. Boulez brought in Jerry Schwartz as, uh, and tried to placate the situation by making Johnny Ware and Jerry Schwartz co-principal. Um, and I think Johnny always resented that, and, and rightly so, in my opinion. Um, but was it, uh, wasn't Jerry at the time rather young as, as well? Wasn't yeah. he like a, a very yeah. young person? He was a young, he was a young guy. Johnny had been in the orchestra a long time. But Bart Hersa said this to me once. He says, it's often the prophet in his own town, right? If you want to make success, sometimes you're better to leave town. He was advising me to go to New York mm -hmm. rather than stay in Chicago and hopefully work my way up the system. Sometimes a prophet has to leave his town and go somewhere else, go to Nineveh and, uh, and be a prophet there and uh, before he comes back to his own town. And so anyway, Jerry, Jerry Schwartz came in. Jerry Schwartz then got the conducting bug and left. And then guess who came in? I took Jerry Schwartz's place. And there was a little tension because of that history with me, another greenhorn coming in. Uh, but Johnny was a superb player. And a, and a really a, a nice, a deep down, a lovely guy, um, uh, a great, great player. Now, Lou Ranger, um, Lou Ranger was actually, uh, how do I put this? When Jerry Schwartz left the Philharmonic, Lou Ranger was brought in um, as a, a, a trumpet player. And so, Lou Ranger was never really quote unquote a member of the New York Philharmonic. He may have been hired for a year or two to play and he was hired to play first trumpet, but he was, he never, when, when my audition came, Lou Ranger and I were in competition for the job. Hmm. And I ended up winning the job and Lou went out to teach out West. Okay. So that's uh, Lou again. Uh, Lou was with Jerry Schwartz in the American Brass Quintet. So that connection with Lou Ranger and Jerry Schwartz, they were of the same generation. They were in the American Brass Quintet. Right. I do. I do know that because I've been able to, you know, trace his history back to the American Brass Quintet. Yeah. But after af any anything afterwards is just sort of lost in the in the realm or the ether of whatever. So well, Lou Lou was. Um, Lou, Lou was the temporary principal trumpet. Yeah, okay. Co principal trumpet at the Philharmonic. And then the audition came with Zubin Mater, and Lou Ranger and I were going like this on and off the stage. It was really an ugly experience. Um, but I ended up getting a nod, and he went out west and taught at the university for the rest of his career. And had, was very active, always has been very active in Aspen. An another lovely guy, great trumpet player. Okay, thank, oh, thank you so much. Question. That helps a lot. And uh, if things had turned out differently, we might have had Lou Ranger doing this. Month. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. Uh, any other questions from anybody? You might want to raise your hand so I can see you. Uh, 
Uh, uh, Steph Hall has a question. Steph, you have to unmute yourself. Okay. So, Phil. How are you, Steph? I'm doing good. How are you? Good. So, what, so what, are, the, what are the most important, important things to, to do in life when we, when, we play our, when we play our own instruments? What's the most important thing for you to do in playing your own instrument? Yes, in life. In life? Yes. Uh, boy, that's a big question. <laughs> Let me narrow it down. Um, the most important thing to do is, is do the best that you can. I mean, when you're playing your instrument, learn, you know, work at all of the elements of playing, right? That, that, that whether it's tonguing, slurring, range, all of that, all the elements of playing, you want to, you want to get as good. I mean, if, if you were interested in football, you'd, you'd want to work all the elements of being as, as good a football player as you can. Uh, or baseball, same thing. So you want to work all those elements. As, as far as life um, and how that apply, applies to trumpet, again, you just want to do the best that you can. You don't know where life is going to take you. I don't know where life is going to take you. The Lord knows where life is going to take you. And he's got that, your, that your days, scripture tells us that our days were planned. Um, there's a wonderful, uh, oh, there is a wonderful verse here uh, from, Jer from Jeremiah. Oh, this is another one of my favorite verses. Um, let me just hang on. It's here somewhere. Here it is. This is, this is God talking to us from Je the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah 29. He says, for I, God, know the plans I, God, have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Then you will call upon me, God, and come and pray to me, God, and I, God, will listen to you. That's the plan for life. You work on your talents and you work on the things that you love, the, the thing that God has planted in you, the, all the things that, that jeep you up. You work on those to be the best you can be and you head into life saying, I know God's got a plan. I don't know how this is going to work, but I know that God's got a plan and he's got something for me to do. And you just watch and you trust the Lord with all your heart and you lean on him and you watch him open the doors. Listen, I was a powder puff when I was a kid. I didn't talk. I, I, I was a shy guy. Um, and, and I never thought that the Lord would be able to open my mouth. I love teaching Bible studies. I love to, I'm comfortable talking in front of crowds of people. I would have never done that as a kid going through high school, talking to people. Are you kidding? But that was a secondary gift that I think that the Lord has, has grown in me as I've gone through my adulthood. So I don't know what future gifts, what latent gifts are down there. You'll find that out. But deal with what you got now. Whatever jeeps you, whatever gets you excited, work at it to the best of your ability. Yes, sir. And trust the Lord to open the doors for you. Yes. Awesome. Uh, Phil, you would love Steph Hall. He's, uh, he's a B-flat bass player, actually, but a uh, real character in our group. <laughs> I, need, I need you in UGA. <laughs> You'd love him. Well, listen, this has been absolutely wonderful. And uh, Phil, you are the greatest of all time. And uh, but you do that uh, by being so humble and you've stayed faithful. And that's an inspiration, I think, to all of us. And although we're muted, I think we want to show our appreciation to Phil with hands. That's it. I see David Merziowski out there, Brittany Scott and Chase Thornhill is even up at this hour. That's unusual. And uh, everybody else that's been a part of this, that's been awesome. I want to thank uh, Anthony and Andrew. Let's give them another hand for their playing. And we have uh, great hopes for our, our Cornet players, Phil. We've, got, we've produced some, some great ones in, in recent years. And uh, uh, we're really proud of them, as uh, not just as musicians, but as young men too. So may they follow in your footsteps. And any final thought to leave us with, Phil? Yeah, I just want to, you had asked me, uh, I was looking at the thing here where you were talking about favorite hymn tunes and yeah. favorite songs. And um, I thought, I, I have two, and, and Matthew probably knows this. Uh, one of my favorite hymn tunes is the tune Repton, mm. which is a great song. And I think about it often in terms of the time that we're in right now. The words of the song are this, Dear Lord and Father of mankind, forgive our foolish ways. Mm. We clothe us in a rightful mind, in pure lives thy service find, in deeper reverence, praise. 
And then it says here, drop thy still dues of quietness till all our strivings cease. Take from our souls the strain and the stress and let our ordered lives confess the beauty of thy peace. I think in a day and age where we see so much strife and, and just chaos going on, it's like, whoa, what is going on? And I heard, uh, what's her I think it was Elmira King say this the other day, and I, and, and, and uh, oh, uh, pastor uh, in Texas, and I've lost his name. Don't get old, you forget things. But he said that both of them said, referred to the same thing and all of this chaos that we're going on. The answer to this is God. The answer to this is relationship with God. When we were going through the Revolutionary War, there was relationship with God. When we were going through the Civil War, there was relationship with God. We're going through, and we're going through World War II, relationship with God. We've come into our cultural crisis today, and we're not supposed to talk about God. God's out the picture. Don't talk about God. Don't talk about God. No, that is the only way we're going to get through this. That is the only way we're going to get through this. So there is my favorite hint to my favorite song, and I'll just leave you with these words. In Christ alone. Mm. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. My light lights me up. My strength makes me bold. My song. I'm a musician. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled and when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ, I stand. So there's an old tune with lovely words, and there's a new hymn with lovely words. So I would just leave with that. Have a great time at TMI. I wish I could be there, and one day, hopefully, maybe next year, we'll do it in person. That'll be awesome. Thank you, Phil, and thanks, everybody, for joining us. That's a great way to end this session. And uh, grab a sandwich and then come back in about 40 minutes for Dr. Stephen Cobb. See you soon. Thank Thanks, you. folks.